tight, get up tight. I'm trying to get as many eyes on me. As many eyes on me. Knee up, knee up, and coming tight. Coming tight. We're brothers. We're brothers. <laughs> See, he's on this one. We're brothers, guys. You good? Gentlemen from Centennial, my name is Mark Soto and I am the executive director of this nonprofit. I am the executive director of the Honorable and it is an absolute honor to have you guys in this event. I wanted to get you guys all together. How many of you have been in this event before? How many? Raise hands. So only a few of you know the story of the Honorable. I'm going to tell you the story again about the Honorable and why we do this event, and why we are so honored about having your school in this event. Back in 2010, I had a son in the U.S. Marines. He was getting ready to be deployed to Afghanistan. And what, as a football coach, what I would do with my wife is we would go down and give the Marines a party to say goodbye and go get some. This one was a little different, because when we went down to Camp Pendleton to do that party, my son never told me where he was being deployed, which was very odd, because he had multiple deployments before that with the Marines. But at this party, he said, Dad, I know I haven't told you where we're going yet. Let's take a walk. So we took a walk. He put his arm around me, and I thought that was very odd. And at that party, he said, Dad, I want you to know that the three, five Marines are going to sing in Afghanistan. Do yourself a favor, don't Google it. So what do you think I did? I immediately got my phone, I Googled it. And on my phone, while I was sitting there giving them a good by party, I learned that the British Royal Marines occupied the area of sang in Afghanistan where they were. I learned that over a, a hundred British Royal Marines had lost their lives, were killed in action. And almost a thousand British Royal Marines were injured, most of them by losing their legs. I found out days before he left. He left. And my son told me later, Dad, when we were landing in our fob, we were surrounded by white flags. Guys, what do we think of when we think of white flags? Surrender, surrender. right? No. No, the Taliban, what they would do is put white sheets on the ground and with black spray paint, they would spray paint death to the Americans, death to the infidels. That's you and I, guys. Death to us. He said the helicopter was landing in their fob and there was pinging coming off the helicopters. They were getting shot at while they were landing in the relative safety of their base. A few days later, after they got acclimated, a patrol left, and after it left, around a mile down the road, they hear a boom! Oh my God, the patrol just left. The radio and the patrol, guys, are you okay? What happened? Are you guys need help? <sighs> radio silence. They realize something happened to that patrol. They leave the base, they mount up, they go, God, we gotta see what happened. The Marines got there, and under enemy sniper fire, they found out what happened the first patrol that left the base. They ran over a bomb. The bomb was so big that it blew up the Humvee in the air, twisted it like a corkscrew, and instantly four Marines lost their life. This is where it gets crazy. I'm at home in Sacramento, California, and I get a phone call from a neighbor. And the neighbor says to me, coach, coach, something's going on at my neighbor's house. There's a Marines a van that pulled up and there were guys dressed in blue and I heard screaming and, and, and crying. I said, what, 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 do you think something happened? He goes, coach, I think their son was killed. I found out who the parents were. I called them up. I found out the Marine's name and I found out that he played football for me. His name was Victor Dew. They, took, they left, the family went left to get the, fam the body of the Marine, their son. And on the way there, they asked me to eulogize their son. It was an honor I will never forget. 
I eulogize her son, and I watch them get, get, him get buried into the ground. A couple days later, my son calls me from Afghanistan. <coughs> He's on the satellite phone. <coughs> dad, dad, dad. My son, are you okay? Are you okay, son? He said, Dad, my colonel tells me that a coach eulogized Victor Dew. Was that you, Dad? I said, yes, yes, son, that was me. I had the honor of eulogizing Victor. He said, Dad, I was there. I cut him out of his vehicle. Life-changing, instant life-changing. As a football coach, I couldn't sit idly by and watch this happen without doing something to get back to these guys that were coming home, that were losing their legs, that were coming home in flagged red carpet, uh, uh, coffins. I had to do something to give back. And that's when my friend Rick Sutter, fellow coach, I'm short. and Victor Dew's mom, this is Victor Dew's mom, who was killed in action that day, we started the honor ball. Guys, by the innocence of your athleticism, by the innocence of you guys being here, people buying tickets, sponsors contributing, your coaches being involved, you're giving back. You're giving back to the men, the women that have given us everything for our freedom. That's the story of the Honorable, the best high school football showcase in America. The one that you are playing in tonight. That's the story. I wanted you guys to hear that. Now, I want you to meet a 3-5 Marine. Let's give it up for Gunny Sergeant Freddie Torres. Right, good afternoon. Uh, it's a tremendous honor and pleasure to stand in front of you and be able to talk about my 25 brothers that are on your way out. You're going to see their face. When 3rd Battalion, 5th Marines deployed, we deployed with about 1,000 when we came back. We came back minus 25. And those are the faces right out there that you play for. So from the bottom of my heart, I truly mean this. Thank you for coming out here and honoring those 25 Marines and playing the game that you play. So I'm gonna tell you a quick story and hopefully this applies at some point in your life, whether you're out in the football field, whether you're dealing with something at home, your parents, relationship, fill in the blank. And I hope this story can get you through it. So I'm gonna fast forward to that same deployment, saying in Afghanistan, December 2010, there was a squad that went out on patrol. There was about 20 Marines. They went out for about three, four hours to gather information, talk to the local nationals, and they were on their way back to the PB, the patrol base. As they were entering about 200 meters out, one of the Marines in the back stepped on an IED, improvised explosive device, a roadside bomb. Luckily, that IED, that bomb didn't go off all the way. Only a partial piece of it went off. That Marine's foot was shattered, the one that stepped on it. Got him in a truck, got him in a helicopter, got him stateside, recovered just fine. Now, there was still a piece of that bomb out there that needed to get blown up or else the Taliban would go pick it up and reuse it on the Marines. So. Some of the Marines that were part of that patrol, they sent a four-man team out there to take a, a stick, a, a, a demolition stick, C4, place it on the ground, and blow the rest of it. As those four Marines went out there, they placed the stick of uh, demolition down. They were ready to pull and blow it when the Taliban from the east opened up firing, a firing position on them. Now, if you picture lone survivor Marcus Luttrell, the movie, when they're at top of the mountain, what it looks like, that's what it, the village in, in Afghanistan looks like. Mud hut walls, dirt, dirt roads, dirt alleys, all that. So as they're putting it down, they, they're about to pull it. The Taliban opens up on those four Marines. Three Marines run to the north. The squad leader, the sergeant, picks up his rifle and starts running towards the enemy fire, suppressing his rifle. He ran that way. There was a little divot and a wall waist high where he was going to take cover and suppress the enemy back. When he got to that divot, got to that wash, he fell on his back, tried to stand up or sit up, and he looked down and realized his entire uniform from the waist down was drenched in red. It was blood. 
Here comes this Marine, one of the three Marines that took cover, started running towards him, slid in on his knees, grabbed his seatbelt, cut his scissors off, ripped off his pants, and there was blood gushing out of the left leg. The mortar already had been hit. Applied gauze, applied a tourniquet, strapped it up, called the squad that was inside the PB to bring out a stretcher. They bring it out a couple minutes later, they put him on the stretcher, and on the count of three, they pick him up. They pick up this sergeant, they start moving him, and the sergeant that's laying on the stretcher reaches his hands over, and the one carrying him is his best friend, and these are the last words he said to him. Tell my mom I'm sorry, and tell my boys I love them. Tell my mom I love her, tell my boys I'm sorry. And he squeezed his hand as he was getting carried out, and those were the last words he said. They get him in the truck, they get him in a helicopter, they get him stateside, they get him here to San Diego to recover. Now let me tell you how this can apply to you. That was January 2011 when he was sitting in bed, in a bed here, laying in a bed, and the doctor came and told him, your leg's getting amputated, too much nerve damage. By the way, you're getting a medical retirement because you're never going to be able to walk or run the same way again. That squad leader, that sergeant took it as a challenge. For a couple days, he accepted it. He was depressed, he had anxiety, he had worries, all that. But within a couple days, he took the challenge. He said, by the time that squad that saved his life gets to March Air Force Base an hour north of here, he was gonna be standing at the bottom of that stairs waiting to, to receive and hug his squad. Well, I share that story with you because on April 15th, I stood down the bottom of that stairway on that tarmac when that plane landed and I hugged every single one of my squad members Oh, and by the way, the next morning, I took him out on a physical training event on the little run here on Camp Pendleton. And that was when the doctor told me that my leg was getting ripped off and I was getting medically retired and that I was never going to walk and run the same way I used to. But I took the challenge and I took the adversity, I took the roadblock, and I went against it because I had the option in my eyes, it was a, I, was gonna, I failed at something. I failed and I had the option to stay down not get myself back up, not pick myself back up, not learn from it, and not do great things for it. That was not an option for me. So I chose not to be a failure. Failing and failing, that's a failure, two different things. And I share that story with you, not for myself, not to put myself up here. I share that story with you because I used to think that I was lucky. I used to think it was coincidence. I used to think that I trained my squad so damn well that they got me out of there. But let me tell you right now, that wasn't the case. I was far from being right. That was God my Savior, my Lord that saved me that day for a purpose to, whatever it was, to be up here and stand, and I hope that it reaches one of you today. That when you're facing the challenges out on the football field, getting hit, it sucks, it injured, at home, you're going through something, you have an option on what you're gonna do. You can let it kick you, put you down, and be what it is, or you can stand back up, learn from it, be great, and do something with it, and then teach something others others about it. Thank you again for being here. The honorable story, last couple of Victor do October 13, 2007, his mom's right behind me. The 24 other Marines that you're gonna see their face on the way out, this is why you do it. And I'm so thankful that you're here doing this, especially with the way our country is. Truly an honor. God bless every single one of you and Semper Fidelis. One more, and then I'm going to break it down and let you go. Let's give it up for Colonel Ogden. Now, I absolutely love this game of football. I love this game of football because of the similarities it has with the Marine Corps. The first thing I love about this game is the sheer physicality of this game. you got to be a hard man to play a tough game. you got to know your assignment, you got to stay low, and you got to drive your legs. And when the game is over, you want to make sure the other team is glad the game is over. The other thing I love about this game is the sheer emotionality of it. Where are my seniors in here? You seniors, use your maturity, use your leadership to help your younger guys deal with the ebbs and flows that occur throughout a game. The last thing I love about this game is the sheer camaraderie of it. The camaraderie that you have built through your sweat, and in some cases your blood, and in a lot of cases your pain. Over the summer, in the weight room, during your two-a-days, 
do your summer practices to get you to this point right now. I'm going to ask you right now, do not play for yourself. You play for the guy on the left and right of you. During the game, you look each other in the eyes. You know that your brother knows you're going to give 100% because you owe him. That's the how you play this game. There are three plays that determine the outcome of the game. The beauty of it, we never know when those three plays are going to happen. That's why every single play you go out there, you've got to give 100%, everything you're worth, for about 33 seconds for each play. Now you go on out there, you strap that chin strip on, and you go hit somebody and have a great game. Good luck. Colonel Hodges! Housekeeping, housekeeping. Coach, who is the man that's going to carry the flag through the tunnel? Cornell Hatcher. Where's Cornell? Yeah. Yeah. All right, Cornell, when it's time for your team to come through the tunnel with all the lights, the sound, everything, we're going to be giving you that flag. I want your team to be behind you, and I want you to whoop it up, wave that flag, and give it up for America. You got it, buddy? Come on. the game. One of you is going to get the character award. Another one of you is going to get an MVP award that's voted on by the media in attendance and there's a lot of them here. And after all that, when we do that on the 50 yard line, all right, we're going to give this coach the 2023 Honorable Championship Trophy, right? Yes. Come on. Yes. To wrap it up, when you guys get the character and the MVP award to coach when you get done with your, your after um, you know, all the media is all done, please come over to the table. And I need you athletes that win those awards to sign the footballs. And coach, I need you to sign the helmets, OK? There's one more thing. There's a gentleman here by the name of Chief Joe um, uh, Pisano. Chief has created a beautiful piece of art that at the end of the games, we want the character and the coaches to put a screw into that because that piece of art is going to be going back and hanging in John Lynch's office at the 49ers Stadium. They have been our presenting sponsor for six years and we want to express our gratitude. And the MVP, too. And the MVP, the MVP character athlete and the head coach, please put a screw in, okay? All right, guys, bring it in. Hands up. Hands up. Hands up. Get as tight as you can. Ready. Ready. Get in here. Ready. When I say 3-5, I want you to yell, get some, and I want it to be loud. 3-5, get some, get some, get some. Get some. them, guys, let's go. Today, before the start of the Punahou Honolulu Hawaii versus Centennial Bank Corona California game, we would like for you to focus your attention to the center of the field. Here is where we will have a few distinguished guests for the building of the battle cross. Please, to maintain the sanctity of this ceremony, we ask that you refrain from clapping or cheering. Color guard, advance.
Kagar. Halt! When a service man or woman is lost in the battlefield, it has become customary to arrange their right hand for the death, along with their boots and helmet. Surviving members of their squad gather around and memorialize their fallen comrades. Some of the troops will pray. Others might recall personal stories, but make no mistake, this is a ceremony that is taken very seriously. Every soldier knows that the next ceremony might be for them. When a rifle with bayonet is downward into the ground, it is a memorial of a soldier killed in action. It also signals a time for a prayer of breaking the action to pay tribute to our friend and hero. Placing the rifle is United States Marine Sergeant Major Louis Ortega, Marine Recruiting Station, San Diego. to represent the final march of the soldier's last battle. Placing the boots is U.S. Navy Chief Petty Officer Joe Posada, active duty reserve, creator of Posada Arch. The helmet is also a symbol of this great sacrifice. The helmet is being placed by USMC Gunnery Sergeant Freddy Torres, Drill Instructor at Marine Corps Recruiting Depot, San Diego. Gunny Sergeant Torres is a Purple Heart recipient, was wounded into action in the Helmet Province of Afghanistan in 2010. Dog tags identify the soldier's name, so he or she will never be forgotten. Placing the tags and being escorted by Colonel Ogden is Gold Star Mother Patty Schumacher, honoring her son, U.S. Marine Lance Corporal Victor Drew 20 of Granite Bay, California, assigned to the 3rd Battalion 5th Marines, who died on October 13, 2010, of wounds sustained when enemy forces attacked his unit with an improvised explosive device. The tags Patty just placed on the right hand are the actual tags that Victor wore when he was killed. Standing blank is U.S. Marine Gunny Sergeant Jerry McCarthy, received recruiting station in San Diego, honoring his cousin, U.S. Army Staff Sergeant Christopher Swenson, killed in action July 22nd in Ramadi, Iraq. Now, now, ladies and gentlemen, gentlemen while you're still standing and our Gold Star families and military members are centered on the 50 yard line, we would we like to acknowledge our new home heroes from the tragic Austrian crash in Melville Island, Australia. During, During the joint international treaty in, in August of 2023, no, no family ever wants to be called the Austrian Gold Star family. family. Thank, Thank you, you for your service, service to our country. country. Thank, Thank you for your service, service to our country. country. Thank, Thank you for your service, service to our country. Thank you for your service, service to our country. Thank you for your service, service to our country. Thank you for your service, service to our country. Thank you for your service, service to our country. I will say their name individually, and we will direct you when to repeat their name. Their name and picture will appear on the video wall. After, we will have a moment of silence followed by the plan Corporal Spencer R. Collard, say Spencer Collard. Spencer Collard. Captain Eleanor B. Lebeau, say Eleanor Lebeau. Major Tobin J. Lewis, say Tobin Lewis.
Gentlemen, let's have a great ball game tonight. Congratulations on being selected for the honor ball. It is uh, it's quite an honor. That is a head with the helmet. That is a tail with the boots. Head, tail. You're a visitor, what would you like to call? He is going to call tails. Schumacher is going to throw the point for us. Tails was called. Very good. And tails it is. Would you like to make your choice now or defer to the second half? You're going to defer. You're going to want to receive now. Which way do you want to kick? Okay, put your backs over here. Centennial, face Ponyhill. Ponyhill 1 has elected to defer. Centennial will be receiving at the scoreboard. Hey, shake hands one more time, guys. Let's have a great ball game. Okay. 